Uh, we want to continue, launch actually a brand new series called Controversial Jesus. How many know Jesus is controversial? <laughs> Just clapping at controversy. All right. I like it. It's good. Good, good, good. So I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine, some of you have really, really active imaginations, but I want you to imagine that you have a time machine. Now, if you see me after in the foyer and you're like, actually, I do, that's not a conversation I want to have. <laughs> Others can have that, but that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one. But I want you to imagine that you had a time machine and you could go back to April 11th, 1912. You say, why so specific, April 11th, 1912? Well, there was a boat that was already left port. It was on the waters and it was called the Titanic. And there was a belief in all of culture, in all of England, everybody was on board, that this was an unsinkable ship, Okay. So this ship has already left port. It's already on the water. Um, you have a time machine, so you're still living in 2019. You know what's going to happen in three days, that this unsinkable ship is going to sink. It's going to hit an iceberg off the coast of Newfoundland, and it's going to sink. So my question to you is, what would you do, hypothetically, obviously, what would you do? Would you simply shout at the people on the boat? who have a deeply rooted belief that they're on something that is unsinkable? How would you engage what you know is coming, the impending challenge? How would, you, how would you engage them? What would that look like? Would it look like shouting and warning? Or would it look like perhaps gathering other lifeboats and rallying people off the coast of Newfoundland to be present for when the eventuality actually happens? You see, the reality is that you and I serve a God who knows the beginning from the end. And what that means is that there are things sometimes that Jesus prophetically speaks into us, that there are things that seem really strong, unshakable, but over time, it begins to see that this is the reality, that the unsinkable sinks, that that which appeared so strong wasn't actually as strong as it appeared. You know, the reality today is that every single culture, every culture since the dawn of history has had a similar belief that their culture, whether it was Roman culture or Byzantine culture, so you can study history and you can see it, that there's these rooted beliefs that we see things the best. This is how to do it. And history shows that they rise and they fall. They rise and they fall. That you and I live in windows of times with which we can make a Jesus-sized difference with our lives. And the honest reality is we're not going to get into a culture war during this message, but here's what I would say that oftentimes Christians believe that they're the ones who are shouting at culture who's on the Titanic that's about to sink. And if you talk to people within culture, they believe that we don't need faith anymore because we have science. And so the church is the one that's on a boat that's sinking that needs to sink because it's actually stopping the progress of modern culture. And so we're shouting at one another, but we're not talking to one another. And we as Canadians, and by the way, this is not a new problem for cultures. If you study history, it's, it's replendent with it. It's actually within the culture that Jesus ministered to. You have the Jewish people, then you've got Romans, you have Samaritans. It was ripe with these major differences, these, these rooted beliefs of hatred uh, towards one another. We're, we're not living in a time where we now have social media, so it's interesting that people now in, in these days don't say things maybe face-to-face, -face, but we go online and we're keyboard warriors and we say things to one another. Listen, that's not new. It's just revealing what's always been. And it's ugly. And it's ugly when I do it. And it's ugly when you do it. And it's ugly when we do it. And we as Canadians, not just as Christians, as all Canadians, all religions, faiths, beliefs, backgrounds, we as Canadians who live in Canada, the 38 million of us or whatever it is now, uh, we hear a lot about diversity. We hear a lot about difference and respecting one another. And how I many of those are lofty values? Absolutely, they're lofty values, no question about it. Um, the problem is, is the adhesive that is meant to hold us together, we're finding out over time, isn't that sticky. And so the adhesive of tolerance, which is meant to hold these differing beliefs together on religion, around sexuality, around life, around politics. How many of you know that our region is going through, like it did in 2017, massive flooding? And if you can go fill some, make, you know, make some sandbags, do it. Make time to make a difference. Engage, help out, and love our neighbors. If you have time, just go do it. Take a couple of hours, three to four hours, you know, and even if you're not 
you know, tremendously physical labor. You can just tie sandbags. Every one of us can help make a difference. But I was so saddened yesterday, just, I'm not going to be political this morning, but I was saddened yesterday just to watch, whether it was social media or watch the news where even our prime minister goes to fill sandbags. And instead of it being about helping our neighbors and volunteerism, it became a politically heated moment. Like, like in all the times, just to lay that aside... And just look at what the devastation is and how can we help. It became this ratcheted up left versus right debate. It's, it's, it's exhausting in our culture to see this continuing. And so we as followers of Jesus, what do we do? Do we shout at the ship? Because when you look at the church, all of a sudden there's cultural laryngitis where they can hear what we're saying, but they can't really make out the heart of what we're saying. And so we're talking past each other and not at each other. And the same is happening on both sides. So how do we do this? How do we, how do we work within moral relativism that says that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth? But what do we do with Jesus who says that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and it cuts through all of it, which means that he's either right or he's wrong. And there's not a lot of wiggle room around it. It doesn't mean that we believe one thing and then we demolish one another, but how do we walk through when this adhesive that is meant to hold us together isn't that sticky? Jesus had a better idea, but it's controversial, and that's what we want to talk about today. You see, because some of you grew up with something called classic tolerance, and classic tolerance is this. It is the idea that we can disagree, even passionately disagree, yet do so with civility, which means I still think you're wrong but I will restrain my desire to destroy another over a deeply held difference. So there's some self-restraint within this. That's classic tolerance. With post-modernity a number of years ago, though, classic tolerance has been absolutely thrown out the window, and we have now is modern tolerance, which sounds more like this. It is the idea that right and wrong are not concrete, they're elastic. And so to disagree with someone is to hate them. Unless you affirm 100% what somebody else's truth is, you're the problem. And the problem with that is it is pushing everything under the surface that is showing up in really ugly ways. Because people don't change often these things. They just hide them. Again, I'm not getting political. I'm just saying the last two elections, the pollsters were baffled because the exit data didn't match the reality. What happened? Sociologists look at it, and essentially what happened is people were new political correctness that I can't say this, and I can't say that, and I definitely can't say that I'm going to vote for this person or that person. So I'm going to tell you what you think you want the answer is, but I'm going to get into the, bo- the polling booth, and I'm going to vote what I really believe. All right? But this is happening over and over and over and over again, that there's these tensions that you and I are living within. So what did Jesus talk about? I want you to turn the person aside, you look them right in the eyeballs, right in the eyeballs. If you don't even know them, you're an introvert, sorry. But look, I'm right in the eyeballs. You can do it. I believe in you. Look, I'm right in the eyeballs and just say these three words, I tolerate you. (laughs) No, come on. How many of you that warmed your soul? Come on, that was beautiful, right? I mean, you're, you're, you go to work and you walk in, you're like, hey, how was your weekend? Oh, it was pretty good. Hey, I want you to know something. I tolerate you. I tolerate you a lot. Actually, I tolerate you with my whole heart. That's not going to come across like a statement of value, is it? It's going to come across like, excuse me? Right? It, So the problem when we look at Jesus is Jesus actually never taught tolerance. Now, he did not teach intolerance. He taught something altogether different. In the final week of his life, we just finished Easter last week, so I want to rewind it a bit. He sees Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is this strong city, a diverse city. A city that seemed so solid. And it says that when he drew near, he saw the city. And the next thing we see Jesus doing is he is mourning. He's weeping. He is moved with compassion. And that's important to note. Because Jesus doesn't look at the city and just judge it, though he is a judge. Jesus, is, his heart is rend. It's, it's, it's torn for what he sees. 
So he's weeping over the city, and in his, through his tears, he says, would that you, everyone say you. Notice how personal he gets here. So Jesus is not talking to the person beside you. He's talking to you, okay? Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. You see, at the heart of tolerance is not tolerance. It's a deeper thing we desire, which is in disagreements and diversity and difference, we still want harmony and peace. And so what Jesus is saying is his heart is broken because everything that they were grabbing hold of that they were believing was going to calm things down or to provide clarity or to prog- you know, make cultural progress, they were not actually the things that were going to bring about peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you, he's prophetically speaking now, when your enemies, everyone say enemies, hold that word, will set up a barricade around you and surround you and will hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you. And then Jesus says, why? Dot, dot, dot. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. When Jesus is moved, miracles usually flow. Everywhere you look through the Gospels where there's this deep compassion, usually you see the miraculous. But in this instant, Jesus speaks prophetically. And a few decades later, if you know history, you know that Jerusalem was invaded and not a single stone was left unturned. That which seemed so solid and strong wasn't as solid and strong as they thought. And Jesus said, he made it real personal, it's because we don't actually know the things that make for peace. And because we don't know the things that make for peace, we become infatuated with these things and we reject him who is the Prince of Peace. Now again, Jesus says destruction is coming for you. Again, because we didn't know the things that made for peace. And in saying all this, he highlights a really strong word, a word that we don't like today. We like, it's the word enemies. You know, it's fine in sports. Like when you see two brothers, the Kachuk brothers, brothers off the ice, enemies on the ice. Like we understand it there. But if we look to the actual, what did Jesus mean when he said enemies? He wasn't just talking about nation warring against nation, though he included that. What he was talking about is because enemy is such a strong word, enemy can also mean one who is hostile to you or your point of view. Has anyone here had anyone ever in their life be hostile to you or your point of view? Okay? He's talking about when that happens in our lives or when we are that way to others. One who attacks you or your differing point of view, one who seeks to oppress you or your beliefs. So again, when that happens in all of our lives, we feel that. The reality of those things happen. All these words and these feelings and these emotions are heightened when you or I are in passionate disagreement around belief, around thought, around what we believe to be true, whether it is whatever the situation happens to be. And this is where Jesus begins to be, contra- he speaks controversial because he begins to correct us. When you and I attempt to change our position, but not our posture, that's where Jesus goes. And so we can change the language with how we're saying things, but if we actually hate in our hearts, then this is not as important as this because this is just lip service. This is reality. And if you're anything like me, sometimes you've got to go to that place and open your heart to God. You see, if you want to grow in following Jesus, I, wanna, I, don't, like, I can't write a book and give you nine tips on it, but I can tell you one thing. If you want to grow in following Jesus, you have to break up with perfection. Perfection will kill you every single time. 
you'll never do this perfect. You'll never be perfect in this. Jesus alone is. And if we want to grow as a church and not just being tolerant, but with what we're going to see Jesus saying a moment ago, we're going to have to break up with perfection, which means we're going to have to fall in love with humility. And you can't control anyone outside of you. You can simply control what you do. That's it. And so here's what Jesus said about these things. James chapter 4, verse 1, before we get to what Jesus said. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Turn the person beside you and say, dumb people. <laughs> it's not what this says, though. Is it not this, that, ye, that your passions, that your beliefs, that your thoughts, that your feelings, that the sum total of how you see the world is also at war within you, that you're wrestling with these tensions with intolerance, and you're wrestling with how do I work this out, or you're wrestling with it, that they're, what did Jesus say, they're at war, and where are they at war? They're at war within us. And so the Prince of Peace is not just a posture, or it's not just a position on the outside, it's something far deeper. When I was reading the Sermon on the Mount, I came across this text, and when I read it, I just went, oh, no. No, 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 no. Oh, 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 I don't like that. See, if you can read everything in the Bible and like it, you're not reading it in context. <laughs> I mean, I, I love it because it's pers prescriptive. I, I love it as much as I love taking Buckley's. <laughs> I've had the privilege in my life of breaking all my fingers, both arms, my toes. I've broken a lot. N nobody likes when they have to set your bone back in place. But how many of you know it's not kindness not to do so? So there's things that we go through that don't feel like, oh, this is just one of those hold your nose Buckley Scripture moments. But we don't want to miss our visitation. And we don't want to miss what Jesus is saying, which actually makes for peace. You have heard that it was said. So you've heard that it was said. In other words, this is what you believe to be true. Now I'm going to tell you what you believe is wrong. So he's offending right off the beginning here. He's not couching in any way. Hey, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And then everybody in the Jewish crowd that day said, amen. Because that's what they were taught. Love your neighbor and hate your, hate your enemy. Hate the one who is hostile to you or your point of view. Hate the one who attacks you or has a differing point of view. Hate the one who seeks to oppress you and your belief. They actually had groups of people like Samaritans who they would have said, yep, that's what it is. So when Jesus tells a parable about the good Samaritan, they go, ah, ah. Tip for those of you who are just new back Easter and a refresher for those of you who have been here a few weeks before that. When you're reading your Bible and Jesus is telling stories and Jesus is doing all these things, yes, you may be a Christian, but never assume you're Jesus in the story. Let's just let Jesus be Jesus and we're some of the other characters in it, okay? That gives us humility. Because if you believe that you're G Christ is in you and we can be in His ambassadors... But he opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Jesus is going to show us something powerful in this text. So you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, and then he said, the, flipped it, love your enemies. So love those who are hostile to you or your point of view. Love those who attack you or your differing point of view or one who seek to oppress. He didn't say tolerate them. He said, love them. Buckley's. And then he said this, pray for those who persecute you. So when there's persecution, you may not, it may not be a horizontal thing that you're going to engage. It's going to be a vertical thing that you're going to begin to pray. And you're not going to pray, God, smite them. <laughs> God, reveal yourself to them the way you've kindly revealed yourself to me. So that, and then the scripture says, so that you may be sons. Everybody say sons. I want to do something completely not politically correct. All the women say sons. Okay. 
It's 2019. I know that this should say sons and daughters, but don't do that. Don't do that in some cases because what Jesus is talking about here is inheritance. And so when you divorce it from culture, you neuter the heart of it, and it's not actually modern. It guts it of its power. What he's actually saying right away is, I want you to love your enemies, and they all would have went, eh, hey, mm hmm and I want you to pray for those who persecute you. And then the next thing out of his mouth, because everyone with them would have been thinking exactly what you're thinking and feeling, I can't do that, which is why he reminds them of their inheritance. He reminds them that they can't do it with their own thoughts, with their own feelings, and with their own beliefs, that you need something that is higher, that is greater, that if we want peace, it's not just going to come through human effort, accords, and all those things. They're wonderful. They're good stepping stones. But unless the heart is changed, it will never be lasting. And so Jesus says that we need something greater so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven, who is above where you are. By a show of hands, has anyone here ever had a feeling, a thought, or a belief that you thought was true in hindsight showed you not the best? Can I see your hands, please? We as followers of Jesus then are not the ultimate end of what we believe for peace. We believe that we need a prince of peace that is larger than who we are, that is higher than who we are. For he makes the sun to rise. This is what Jesus says. Listen, he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. In other words, my solution isn't to, isn't to come in and to wipe out all that's bad. It's to give you peace within the midst of the turmoil. I'm not going to separate it here. And sends rain on the just and on the, on the unjust. The same God is going to be gracious to both. So again, Jesus is correcting this misinterpretation of Old Testament because nowhere does it give permission for you to hate your enemy. And classic tolerance where we have civility is wonderful for our position, but if our posture isn't changed, then it's not really powerful. And that was a lot of P words in one sentence. And so Jesus taught that our posture was to be one of love and of prayer towards our enemies or those who persecute us. And if it hasn't got worse, I'm going to make it even worse. If, if you're not like discouraged enough, I'm going to discourage even more. Because here's what it says. Jesus only taught that this posture should flow in a single direction toward our enemy. It doesn't say that they're going to reciprocate the same in kind. doesn't say if you do this, then they, no, they still may not, yet you're called and I'm called or to love and to pray. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you. Truth isn't always nice to pull into our hearts and palpable. It's even controversial to, make a, to do a Mark Driscoll quote, but I'm going to go for it. Self-control is what happens when you don't respond to the person or circumstance in front of you. That takes self-control. But it's more than that, is that you may not respond to them, but you do respond to the Holy Spirit that's in you. And so what we're seeing is that modern tolerance can't hold the weight or the tension of just how differently we see things. In following Jesus, we are still going to have passionate disagreements around beliefs with other Canadians. But instead of giving us tolerance, Jesus gives us himself. Instead of giving us a cliche, he gives us truth. Because remember, Jesus wants to use all this tension to help shape and mold our character to be more like Jesus. I love how Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, and I love the intentional choice of this word for your heart and for my heart. Listen to what he says. He's reminding us, for while we were, what? Enemies. While you and I were enemies to God, when we were hostile to his point of view, when we would openly attack, or then we'd see that his heart of love for us was oppressive. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more now that we are what? Reconciled. Shall we be saved by His life? 
More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now, and here's the word, received, not earned. We have received reconciliation. It is a gift. Tolerance can't hold all of our differences, and the evidence for that we see all around us. But the love of Jesus is strong enough. But here's the thing. Jesus is not only going to change them, he wants to change you. Jesus isn't only going to correct them, he's going to correct me. He's going to correct you. Jesus isn't only going to touch that, he's going to touch all of this. Why? Because he is fully gracious and he is also fully true. And it is God's kindness that is meant to lead you and I to this thing called repentance. So what does it look like for us to engage this? Well, don't settle for the mirage of tolerance when you can have the Prince of Peace present in your heart and in your life. Love your enemies by first admitting, God, I don't know how to do that. And then begin to pray for them every single day. God, I pray that you would bless them. And you're going to pray it through gritted teeth. You're going to pray it maybe not with your feelings, not with your emotions. You're just going to pray it by faith, no feeling at all. But let the Prince of Peace work on your heart. Leave the outcome in his hands, and you just be obedient to do what he's called you to do. And it may not be reciprocated, but that doesn't mean that you're not still called, and I'm not still called, and we're not still called to do what Jesus called us to do. So this week, what's a step that you could take? Well, you could list those who see things drastically different than you, and this week you could pray for them. You could ask Jesus to change your posture towards them. And you may say, well, what about them? You work here and let him work here. 